Hello and welcome to uh, this special debate organized by the World Economic Forum and France 24 in Davos. It's been established that uh, 2014 was the world's warmest year on record. On its own, it may not prove that the climate is changing, but what if I tell you that the top three warmest years throughout recorded history have all happened in the past decade? Scientists say it's evidence that the climate is changing, and they say humanity is responsible by pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Without radical action, there are warnings the globe is heading for a climate disaster. Well, leaders will be gathering in Paris at the end of this year to avert it. Each country will bring their individual contributions to the negotiating table, which will then be baked into a worldwide agreement. But will this bottom-up approach actually work? In this debate, with a little over 10 months to go before Paris, we're asking how a comprehensive global climate deal can be achieved and how to make it stronger. From Kyoto to Copenhagen, via Lima and onwards to Paris. The history of international climate talks have had stops and starts. Even scientists have been at odds over the risks associated with global warming, and as the world sets its sights on a new deal to limit climate change, policymakers and negotiators will have to weigh up the following figures. World leaders have committed themselves to limit the rise in global temperatures to 2 degrees Celsius by 2100. There are warnings the world would face catastrophic climate change beyond that key level, although some say the threshold is actually lower. At current emission rates, scientists warn the world is currently heading for an increase of up to 4.8 degrees in global temperatures by 2100, around twice the recommended level. At current rates, 2034 is the year in which the world will have emitted enough CO2 to raise temperatures by 2 degrees. That's almost an entire lifetime earlier than the target. Scientists from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change say greenhouse gas emissions need to fall by as much as 70% by 2050 to meet the 2 degree target. By 2100, emissions will need to be at zero. 196 is the number of countries that will be meeting in Paris to reach a global climate deal. The question is whether they'll reach an agreement that will make a difference. Now, there are multiple stakeholders uh, when it comes to this issue and uh, to debate how a comprehensive climate deal can be achieved. Uh, we have a stellar cast with us here in Davos. I want to thank you all for, for taking part in this debate. And uh, let me just introduce you to the panel members. Uh, Felipe Calderon is the former president of Mexico and now the chairman of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, a group that argues that uh, action on climate uh, will provide an economic boost Laurent Fabius is the foreign minister of France, which will, of course, be playing host to the Paris conference in December of this year. Christiana Figueres is the executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Michel Yes is the chief executive officer of Swiss Re, which is uh, doing a lot of work when it comes to climate change and uh, the insurance risks associated with it. Fekir Sibisma is the chairman and chief executive officer of Royal DSM. He's a strong voice within business for a transition away from fossil fuels and uh, for a uh, global carbon pricing framework. Thank you once again to, to all five of you. I, I want to start talking about where we are now in, uh, in January of 2015, with little over 10 months to go. And I, I want to start by asking Christiana Figueres, uh, about the, 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 the climate negotiations that, that wrapped up in Lima, in Peru, at the end of last year. Uh, what was the main takeaway from that conference? And what does it mean as we now look ahead to, to Paris? I think uh, the main takeaway from Lima is that countries continue to be committed. Uh, and I dare say, actually, truly putting up their sleeves to get into the last stretch. They have been working on this agreement for several years, every single one of them, even those that are finding it even more difficult to find their space. None of them have said that they're out of the skin. They are all completely committed 
to coming to Paris uh, and finding a climate, a climate agreement that is going to have to be a very different agreement to what we had on the Kyoto Protocol. <coughs> One way of looking at it is a house with many rooms, not like the Kyoto Protocol that we had a house with two rooms. It's going to have to be a house with many rooms. And how do you accommodate the variety of different national circumstances and different economies that there are in the world? That is one of the big challenges. And also, um, how do you move forward in the, the timeline and the scale that science demands? And that, I think, is the major challenge. As you said in your beginning, how do we ensure that this agreement is not just a collection of very good efforts from both governments and, and uh, private sector, but that it actually does have in it the transformational force that is going to allow us to make a difference. All right. That's something that we're going to be discussing in this debate, I hope, how we actually can race the ambitions ahead of, of, of Paris. Uh, before we start, though, in earnest with that conversation, I want to ask uh, Laurent Fabius uh, about something called the Paris Alliance. The European Union has called for, for this thing called the Paris Alliance. Basically, the European Union wants to build a consensus uh, around a climate deal. Do you think that this consensus is building now from, from your perspective? Je vais parler anglais. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Uh, so far as consensus is concerned, uh, in the recent years, there has, have been uh, three major changes, and we are not always aware of that. First, there is less and less climato skepticism because of science, and it's a major shift. Second, uh, the uh, private companies, uh, now many of them, most of them are committed, which was not the case before. And third, uh, the uh, political leaders, most of them are committed. Therefore, when you have that, it's not a solution, but it's already uh, an asset. Now, what are we expecting for Paris? Uh, four things, which are very difficult to achieve because uh, consensus is necessary. 196 parties. First, we have, and that the basic element, to uh, reach a new legal framework for after 2020. It's the so-called uh, legally binding agreement, A. B, uh, before Paris, every single na nation will deliver uh, its national commitment, uh, which uh, will set what are its ambitions and goals uh, so far as, as uh, gas emissions are concerned. Therefore, we shall have a sort of addition. Three, uh, nothing is possible if we don't have uh, financing. Uh, the figures are very high, but uh, we have in parallel to Paris to be able to say, well, Ladies and gentlemen, these figures will be available. And fourth, and it's the point uh, which we were, you were touching, uh, we have decided uh, in Lima uh, to um, deliver a Lima Paris action agenda. What does it mean? It means that not the government, but uh, the local authorities, businesses, public and private investors, uh, international financial institution and others, uh, they will uh, deliver elements to um, foster the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. And these four elements are the basis for a success in Paris. Filippo Calderon, you, you have an experience of international negotiations as the former president of, of Mexico. From your perspective, what stands in the way now as I say, in January 2015, of a comprehensive uh, climate deal in Paris. What, what, what needs to be resolved in the months looking ahead? Well, one thing is what the Minister Fabio is, is saying in the sense that uh, money is required to finance the change. But beyond that, there is another big obstacle, in my opinion, and it is the general perception that to take an action on climate change implies huge economic costs either for governments, for people, for companies. And for that reason, uh, people, companies, and government just 
They don't like to take action. It's expensive, or it sounds to be expensive. But the good news is, uh, according with the report we produced, the new climate economy on the Global Commission for the Economy and Climate, in which Michelle and myself are members, Professor Lord Nicholas Stern, he present this co-chairman, we are we research and we demonstrated that it is possible to have economic growth, job creation, poverty <coughs> reduction, and at the same time to tackle climate change. Mm -hmm. But the condition is that we need to take very brave actions, very bold decisions, smart choices, to change three big systems, cities, energy, and land uses. But if we change those systems, for instance, a new model of cities in which one billion more people will live in the next 15 years, it is not going to be in this sprawling model with hundreds of square kilometers expanded of cities, but it must be in more coordinated, uh, compact cities, uh, connected cities, more oriented towards the use of massive transportation means and less to individual cars. If we do so, if we switch towards renewable energy with low carbon emissions, we will be able to get not only climate change responsibility, and we can tackle climate change, but also we will have economic growth, and we will have uh, jobs. Why? Because we can foster innovation, which is the most powerful engine of economic growth, we will foster the efficiency of natural resources beyond the efficiency of capital labor, for instance, which is the traditional speech of economists. And we can increase, at the same time, uh, technology in, and investment in infrastructure. And let me finish with this. Mm -hmm. If we follow this current model of high-intensive carbon emission, we will spend roughly $90 trillion in infrastructure. Well, if we invest in the other model, the new climate economy, we will invest roughly $90 trillion as well. So if we are going to spend such amount of money, let's do the right thing in the new model. But we need to demonstrate that you cannot, you should not be afraid that you are not going to hurt the economic growth doing the right things. Michel, yes, Swiss Ray advises countries and also sub-state actors on how to mitigate climate change and also what the potential costs of, of climate change could be. What kind of sense do you get from the clients that you have? What kind of sense of urgency do you get from, from, the, from the governmental side? Uh, do countries understand the risks and are they willing to act to, to, to mitigate them? No, they definitely understand the risk. I think uh, there, there is a, a good understanding about what we are, we are facing. Um, uh, to be honest, we as an industry, we don't need to be motivated to address also these kind of issues because we, we don't ensure climate change, let's be clear. It's not something that can be insured because that would be a fantastic solution. <laughs> then you can close everything and uh, the entrants are taking the burden. And but you, we... you could go bust, essentially, that's what you're exactly. saying. Exactly. But I could the go world. Home. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we ensure the, the consequence of that. And uh, what is extremely important in the debate that we have these countries is also to put a price tag on the consequences of the decisions which are taken or the decisions which are not taken. And that definitely brings the debate to a level which is an interesting one. Then comes the famous debate in which we need to find a, a compromise, if I may say, between some of the consequences, which are you know, a catastrophe which may happen each 10 years, each 15 years, and the democratic rhythm in a country in which the elections are happening each four years or each six years. And, and we need to, to, to bring the people to understand that these two horizons are compatible if you want to address really the future challenge of this planet. But the main contribution that we bring in the debate is the price tag that we put on the, on the table uh, about decision. And we are, I would say, credible enough to be quite neutral in the scientific debate that the price tag is, is not too much discussed. And I think that brings the debate to something which is interesting. And if I may conclude on, on something else, that's the, the liability side of the insurance industry. You may know that we have also assets which are covering the liability. And these assets are enormous. And they are uh, often of any kind of opportunities currently, to be honest, because of the low yield environment. And as President Calderon said, we need to invest in infrastructure. There is a fantastic match between the assets of the insurance sector and the infrastructure need. And let's make sure that the rules of the game correspond to what I would say are the political intention in that respect. Because I think that's also a way in which our industry can contribute. So not only on the liability side, but also on the asset side. 
by helping this planet to uh, invest strongly in infrastructure. Uh, Faker Sibusma, I want to turn to you next. We heard from Minister Fabius mm. that well, he at least believes that companies uh, and multinationals, for instance, are becoming more aware of this climate change issue uh, and the need to do something about it. Is that your reading as well within the business community? Are businesses now more aware of the climate change risks? Well, there's a very good question you ask, and I'm wondering also at this very moment what this audience and what the viewers of the television program are thinking. 98% of the scientists in the world are convinced that we have a huge problem. If you do polls under the population, we get a little bit 50-50 percentage. So I'm sure that our viewers at this moment are saying, well, how big is the problem? And I think the scientists say the problem is big. The media sometimes give pros and cons like medias need to do, and that confuses some of the television watchers. So awareness think, is not as high as it should be? Uh, that is the reason why business need to step up, to make also clear we have an issue and create a fertile ground on which politicians can make next steps. Because, let's be honest, the Elysee or the White House or the UN building is not taking care of the emissions. Companies are taking care of the emissions. So we need to take a step forward, even when politicians have not yet agreed with each other. And on that ground, it is much easier for politicians, because they have the mandate for legislation, of course, not companies, to make a legislation and to make the next steps forward. Because we as companies cannot allow to postpone the problem and to give it to a next generation. The next generation, they will spend a fortune and they will have a big problem in their society. And I think it's our responsibility not to do that. And the good news is what <coughs> President Calderon said. All research shows that if we are addressing climate change, we can have economic growth at the same moment. And we as business, and we discussed that also this week here in Davos, have concrete steps which we have in mind to take in that road to Paris. Christiana Figueres, I saw you nodding there uh, as Faike Sibusma was, was talking. What's your reaction? Well, it's, it's very important. You know, what if I could just said is um, business needs to take a leadership role and really needs to lead the charge. It's a very important statement because I have watched over 20 years that I have been in this, uh, in, in this uh, discussion very much of a you first attitude where businesses have been saying for a long time, quite rightly so, governments, you first give us regulatory certainty, and then we're going to come on board. And the government's turning around and going, well, I'm not quite sure that I can jump into the, into the cold water because I need to make sure that my country, my economy, my businesses are going to be competitive with respect to my neighbors. So this you first, you know, has led us into a very, very difficult dynamic, which is the result that we're seeing right now. And so to hear businesses stand up and go, well, we know that governments are getting there slowly, very slowly, but they're moving in the right direction. And in the meantime, we're going to take leadership. Uh, and they can take leadership, let's be clear, to a certain point. Because in order to make the kinds of shifts of capital that, um, that Michael is talking about, Michelle is talking about, is actually they need much more to know what is the long-term goal going to be so that those assets from the insurance companies, but not just insurance companies, from most of the large institutional investors and asset holders can actually shift in and align with these 90 trillion that uh, President Calderon has been speaking about. So that shift is, has to occur. And that has to be hand in hand government with business together. We can no longer afford the you go first and I will follow attitude. We're just run out of time for that one. All right, lady and gentlemen, we're going to take a short break now, uh, but we will be back shortly with uh, more uh, from this uh, climate change debate uh, underway in uh, Davos. Do stay with us. Time to take a sip of water. That's the water. Water is water here. Fantastico. Is that yours? Is this Lemia, no? Yeah. That's for me. tiene el otro lado. Other side for you. You want some? Uh, yes. Can I give you water? Uh, yes, dear. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, dear. There we go. Everyone's hydrated. Yeah. Yes. They say that, uh, that Davos is a marathon, and we should keep hydrated mm -hmm. considering that. OK. Welcome back to uh, Davos, and welcome back to this debate on how to reach a global uh, comprehensive climate change deal by the end of uh, 2015, as we're looking ahead uh, to the Paris conference in uh, December. We are here once again with a stellar debate panel, and uh, we're going to get straight back into it. So now, we've already touched upon it. We, we've talked about how the, the ambition before the Paris conference is to, to, to build or to have a bottom-up approach, as in each country should bring their own contributions to the negotiating table, and then the idea is to, to, to bake them all into a, a wider deal. So far, though, the, the, the contributions that have been voiced by individual countries, they haven't been good enough in order to, to meet the, the, the two-degree target, or to meet the target to limit climate change to two degrees. So my question to, to, to the panel is, how do you raise ambitions and how do you encourage countries to be braver and to be bolder? Uh, Laurent Fabius, I want to ask, ask you, as, as the host of, uh, of COP21, uh, first, what are your thoughts? Uh, first, I, I think that the, the companies and, and more generally the civil society can help because if they are convinced that it is a necessity, uh, the politicians uh, will have to deliver and the decision in Paris will be taken by politicians because people will vote. That's the first uh, thing. Second, uh, as uh, we've said uh, a few moments ago, uh, every single country will have to uh, put uh, its own contribution. Already we know that uh, some countries or continents are um, in the vanguard. For instance, Europe has taken in October uh, decision which is good, which is in line with uh, the ambition we can have. There are new elements. The agreement which has been passed before uh, between uh, US and China is quite new. Obviously, when calculation will be made, we shall see if it is enough. But it's brand new if we compare you with, with what was the situation a few years ago. And my understanding is that when everybody will have put uh, publicly uh, its own um, um, contribution, there will be expertise, uh, there will be calculation which will be made by different elements. Uh, yourself, uh, Christina, uh, you will uh, have uh, to make uh, expertise. And, and then we shall see exactly where we are. And it will be, you know, Paris, it's not only the end of something, it's the beginning of something, uh, a new impetus. And I think it will not uh, be uh, done uh, within one minute. But it's a major shift and it's the beginning of um, an, a new awareness. Uh, President Calderon, you've, you've been speaking uh, about the economic argument to, to reach a, a climate change deal. How do, you, uh, how do you persuade countries, though, that they need to get on board with those ideas? And, and do you think that that argument that you presented before that will, will be enough? The point is, the argument we have so far have not been enough. In the sense, talking about the consequences of climate change, it is really bold, but it has not been enough in order to mobilize people and governments and decisions. If I talk to the people in France, and remember them, the heat wave some years ago that killed thousands of people in France, especially old elder people, and talk about the extreme events related with weather, in Philippines, uh, the typhoon killed more than 6,000 people. So the extreme events are present. Are those events uh, uh, bold enough to persuade people? Maybe yes, with some minutes, some moments. And then the government say, well, me as president, me as prime minister, I have elections in two years, and these guys are talking about weather in 50 years. Well, mm -hmm. just pass the, ball, pass the ball to the next one. No, I'm talking that. On top of the environmental arguments, we need to provide economic alternatives and even social alternatives. Think about China. China, by tradition, was a very difficult country in order to get the Chinese people into the table, get it to the table. However, it is clear, for instance, the air pollution in Beijing, which according with the climate report, new climate economy report, caused 
thousands of people with uh, uh, diseases and uh, premature deaths, for instance, and economic damages. More than 11% of the GDP in Beijing is, loose, is lost by, by these kind of uh, premature deaths. Well, these kind of phenomena associated with climate are moving and pressing probably the decision makers in China to get the right direction. And this agreement between China and the United States is completely new in the landscape. Now, mm -hmm. China needs alternatives, for instance, to phase out the coal, the production with coal, uh, with renewable, and need support to recover forestry, and need support for a lot of things. And if I talk about China, I'm talking about sub-Saharan African countries. They need economic support, and they can provide, for instance, uh, process to recover the, the landscape or the forestry there, as long we can build an agreement in which there is an exchange and negotiations in which, yes, I establish a commitment as a less developing develop, uh, country, but at the same time receive some kind of support. Middle countries like Mexico or Brazil or Indonesia, we can do things, we must do th things. And actually, we, we have done in Mexico, we established the first law that establishing mandatory goals for climate change and carbon emission reductions, and Mexico could improve. Renewable energy is providing new alternatives for the people. Companies, even in the mining sector, companies are switching towards uh, solar energy, and solar energy is providing energy for mining companies 40% cheaper than the traditional utility. So my point is, there are huge economic opportunities. Only, for instance, energy efficiency. Energy efficiency will fix more than half of the change we need to, to do in energy. And renewable, renewable is 80% cheaper than eight years ago, especially solar. So the opportunities are there. Economic opportunities. If we can manage the environmental arguments, but on top of that, the economic opportunities, the decision makers would say, well, it's not exactly a sacrifice. Actually, business community here in Davos, instead of thinking, how can I make more profits, which is valid, it's illicit, we can say, you can make money if you jump into the new economy, if the government take the right public policy decisions. Faki Sibisma, do you think that businesses are, are, are ready to listen to that? Are, are they willing to listen to that? Do, do, do they get that message? Well, let me even go a step further and put the ball in the middle so that the politicians in December uh, in Paris uh, can make a next step. I think we need to continue with awareness. And politicians need awareness by their voters, because otherwise the politicians come in a difficult situation. That's one. Second thing, I think, and as companies, we are uh, advocating that we need a price on carbon. We need a price on carbon, preferentially, in the whole world. And there might be local differences, but we need to have a price on carbon. And with the today's oil price, which is lower, that is very relevant. Uh, because what is competitive in technology is not only what is competitive, but it's also a matter of convention. We had one time in history that we did not pay for labor. It's called slavery. And we changed the convention. And we need to change the convention also that we need to pay for pollution and that carbon has a price. That's the second point. The third point, and as companies we are saying that, a price on carbon, even with a floor, and that is an offer we can do as companies to the politicians. Now, you need to make legislation, but we even, as a set of companies, said that is a wise thing to do. The third thing we need to do is pushing further alternative technologies. Solar, much more can be done in solar. Second generation biofuels, you're losing agricultural waste. We have a lot of that. And sometimes that needs investments in technology. Sometimes that needs different regulations and policies to make those new forms of energy really viable. Fourth, I would say, Let's create more transparency in the financial world. Where have we invested our money in? In pension funds, in banks, etc. How much is fossil linked? How much is not fossil linked? I'm not saying that you should invest here or there. Let's first create the transparency where our money is. And then maybe the fifth thing is setting targets. Of course, we need to set targets. But the problem, I think, in Copenhagen was we over-focused only on setting targets. And let's be honest, Mother Earth is not helped by only setting targets. Mother Earth is helped if we just take actions and make next steps. And Christiana companies Figueres. are ready to go. Christiana Figueres, uh, what's your sense and what's your opinion on that? Setting targets and the, and the need for, for steady targets, uh, middle, medium term, short term, long term. 
Well, I, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I don't think FICA me means is that mutually exclusive. You have to do both things at the same time, right? And, and we're all adults. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, we do have to have action right now because if we don't start this ball rolling, we're not going to get to any long-term destination. But we also need to know where we're going. And we do it in our everyday lives, right? When we get on my bicycle or my Brio's car or whatever, uh, I usually know where I'm going. Um, and if I'm going in a, in a, on a long path where I don't know the, the road, which I usually don't, I set the GPS. And it tells me where I'm going and how long it's going to take me. Well, it's the same thing, right? I don't get into the car only with, you know, the documents that I need for my meeting and making sure that the tank is filled because I know that I have, you know, I need the tank and I need my, my, uh, my, the other battery also working for me. I need both batteries. But you have to get into the car with both things. You have to get in with your action that you have right now as well as knowing where you're going, how long it's gonna take you, right. and how much is it going to cost you. And then, and then, if you know all of that, then as governments, because the governments will have to set all that scenario up, then governments should actually stand away, just set the right incentives and let the private sector get us to the final destination in the most effective way. My, my greatest story about this is New York. I was in New York uh, at the uh, Secretary General's uh, summit uh, a couple of months ago. And for those of you who were there, you know it is absolutely crazy traffic. So I put myself in the middle of the street, uh, endangering my life because I was desperate for a taxi. Finally get a taxi, jump into the taxi, uh, and I'm you know, struggling to figure out where I'm going. I don't have my documents on me. And, he, and she goes, Madam, where are you going? And I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll figure out in a minute, but I know I'm going uptown, can you start going uptown? And he turns around to me and he goes, lady, Tell me exactly where you're going, and I will get you there faster and cheaper for you. Well, that's a lesson from the universe, isn't it? That's what we need to know. We have to get into the car, but we also need to know where we're going. So the two things need to go hand in hand, and that is what's going to allow us the efficiency and the technology development and the cost efficiency to get us there. I just want to back the tape a little bit. Fika Siebesma also has talked about the, the, the need from the business perspective of a global framework when it comes to carbon pricing. We can talk for a very long time indeed exactly how a carbon pricing model would look like, and we don't have enough time to do that in this debate. I still want to ask, though, uh, Laurent Fabius, do you think that there will be a global framework for, for, for carbon pricing as part of the, of the Paris deal, or, or, or is that just wishful thinking? I will have a diplomatic answer. I'm not sure. <laughs> it will be done uh, in Paris. But I think that uh, it's an uh, absolute necessity, and we have to explain and to show by uh, experience that it works. Uh, not only in um, some companies or some economic sectors, but in some regions. You have regions uh, where they apply that. There can be some differences, but uh, step by step, we have to go into the direction. Uh, and I will um, completely uh, admit uh, the story of the taxi uh, with Christina, knowing that we have to take an electric taxi. Yes. Don't remember. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, it's part and parcel of the necessity, carbon pricing. There is another necessity, another actor, which is very important, which is not represented here, it's our local authorities everywhere. Because they are, uh, companies are very important, governments are important because they vote, but uh, many and maybe most of the decisions in this sector will be taken by the local authority, regions, towns, and, and we have to uh, push them to go into the direction. Michel, yes, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, there is probably a lot of goodwill, and we, we all agree. That's probably, by the way, the problem of a debate where everybody agrees. Yeah. So uh, there's not a lot of debate. We, we discuss about the methods. There is something in which uh, we, we have a, an interesting experience. It's the, the reinsurance of natural catastrophe. We perfectly know that not all natural catastrophe are consequence of climate change. An earthquake is not a consequence of climate change. But what, what is interesting and a little bit sad to observe, and that's probably one of the reasons of the awareness also, is that three quarters of the large catastrophe 
which happen on this planet are simply uninsured. They, they, they are not known by the financial sector. So there is not an awareness about what is happening. And uh, I must say the visibility of the country would do take the responsibility to assume financially what may be the consequences of natural catastrophe, which are very often, if it's drought, if it's floods, consequence of climate change, the visibility of the goodwill of these countries is, in my view, too low. Mexico is one of the first countries we decided at government level to take an insurance about their own infrastructure and their own people if something is going badly. It's earthquake and, uh, and wind. But I believe that a piece of pressure would make sense. And in all fairness, I believe that something which will go in a little bit like what the rating agencies are doing in matters of financial solidity of the countries, if something would happen in the same sense about awareness and financial readiness on how to deal with these kind of extreme events, country by country, I believe it would improve the visibility of the countries which show goodwill. And uh, without that, you know, without kind of pressure, and it can be peer pressure, I, uh, I believe it would be a bit too easy for us, for the business, to pass the baby to, to the political level and to simply say, okay, try to agree on something on which actually we do follow your good intentions, but we expect you to give us more or less the, the rules. So a kind of peer pressure at political level between countries wouldn't be, wouldn't be too bad. Mm. Philippa Calderon. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start taking questions in a, in a moment or so. But I still want to to to, to gauge your view on on what we just on what we just heard from Michel Liel. Oh, the point is the point is this: carbon tax or any way to price carbon must be an economic signal to the players, regardless the amount of money you can raise, regardless if the tax is a net tax or is a neutral one meaning that you can put the carbon tax and withdraw other kind of taxes, for instance, labor tax. But anyway, the point is the society and the investors need clear economic signals. And we have not yet such kind of signals. In the moment in which the governments establish clear signals saying we are going to follow this low carbon pathway, in that moment, a lot of investors will jump into the new economy. Because currently, in this uncertainty, they are only following a strategy of wait and see. They are seated in defense, if I can say that. And we need to mobilize, shaking them, in order to jump into the field. And the only way to do that is to produce certainty coming from the government. Meanwhile, for instance, an energy company will invest in green economy, renewables, and will try to hedge his mo its money and will invest in, in gray economies as well. And that will increase the cost of financing such kind of investment. It's going to delay the decisions in the company. It's going to increase the cost for everyone. So we need to decide one way. You know, in the future, this will be the economy. By the half of, the, of this century, I'm very sure I can bet. The economy will move towards low carbon path. But the problem is, if we do so too late, it's going to be honestly too late for the planet. If we don't act in the next 10 years, it's going to be too late. Four Celsius degrees. The, the Earth increased less than one degree in 130 years. Less than one degree. And I, I agree. Not all the extreme events, weather events, are related with climate change. But a lot of them are. And in the future, with four degrees, four degrees, imagine what is going to happen. If the Antarctic and Groland are melt, even in next century, the level of the sea will increase at least two meters. Is that a catastrophe or not? It is going to be climate change or not? But forget about it. It's going to be a massive problem. We need to change now. And the way to do that is we need to provide the signals. Carbon tax will be a very powerful signal. It's like a light in the street. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. Uh, Please make me aware if you have a question. We have some roving uh, microphones uh, in the room. Um, you, sir, in the second, second row. And as I say, please make sure that your question is actually a question <laughs> and make it succinct and brief. Uh, my question is to Mr. Philip Calderon. Uh, India is a great example. Uh, Indian government has just announced a 160 gigawatt of solar and wind commitment equivalent to 200 billion that right policy 
uh, government policy can attract a lot of uh, right investments by the private sector. We, uh, uh, we wanted your opinion. I attended G20 under your leadership. And there was a commitment made at uh, G20 as well as Rio 20 that developed nations would make uh, huge supports uh, to the developing nations in uh, making that dream reality. Right. So what's been the progress, sir? Well, uh, that is important, but a qu good question. But Prime Minister Moody, if I understand, he talked about he was dreaming to establish solar cells in each single house in India, in the poorest family, and that's fantastic. But thinking in India, for instance, in India made one big change. When I was a child, a symbol of progress is to have one fixed telephone line in each home. Mexico had never one single fixed line in each house, India either. But there is no sense. Technology make this big change, and it's completely unnecessary. Any single home has a mobile phone. And that could happen with electricity, for instance. Do we need these very expensive and polluting transmission grid, grills? or we can provide electricity coming from each single poor house in India through solar panels. It's completely feasible. It's affordable. It's convenient. It's profitable. <clears throat> if you have a company and want to make business, don't jump into oil business because it's a risky business these days. No? <laughs> jump into renewable businesses and go to, to India and get support from the government and the international community, as you were saying. OK, next question. Uh, in the third row, the gentleman. Yeah, Lord Joseph, uh, do you think the current oil price is a blessing or is it really a problem? Who, who, who is your question directed at? The entire panel. Who, who feels the need to, to answer that question? Fike. Of course, the current oil price uh, makes it for renewables um, less, and less competitive uh, at once in half a year time. Therefore, a carbon pricing, I think, is the right moment. Uh, and what you see now is uh, in this movement of oil prices and development of technology, and as I said already, new technologies need to be stimulated, sometimes by technology development, sometimes by policies. And what we see here, target setting is important. We need to move forward, like Christina is saying. But companies are willing now to step up. And I would only say, is this not the present? for the politicians. And imagine you let this moment go and you do not make a deal in December. Is that not a great opportunity? We miss and we let go. And is it not a responsibility for all of us to do that? And companies are willing to commit themselves. I would say, don't waste that moment. Christiana Figueres. Um, you know, I've thought a lot about this, uh, this oil prices and I think it's both a threat and an opportunity. It, it is a threat because of what FICA has said, that some, some of the renewable energy projects that are not completely bedded down because they don't have a signed PPA or because they don't have the investor group that is already completely committed to it are certainly being delayed. At the same time, at the same time, the low oil price, what it has done is it's already beginning to take off the market all of the very, very expensive oil projects. So just in the past three to four weeks, we have four projects, very expensive projects, whose concession has been returned by the, uh, by the oil and gas companies to Greenland because they are no longer feasible. So you're already beginning to see that the expensive oil exploration, which is deep sea, Antarctic, tar sands, all of those, that whole category, uh, which is what we call the stranded acid argument, is already no longer theory, but it's actually already reality, right? So those, uh, those assets are already beginning to be taken off the table, which is very good for climate. Um, and it's very good because it opens more space for renewables. At the same time, all of those renewable projects that actually do have their, their financials already bedded down are moving forward. The amazing thing is that the renewable energy industry, certainly the solar and certainly the, the wind, are now so, um, so mature that they are standing on their own two feet, despite the fact that oil is currently temporarily low but will go back up. And so I completely agree with Fike. This is a fantastic opportunity to take this oil, these, these, these moments of oil, low oil prices and do a couple of things. Remove fossil fuel subsidies. Nobody would notice it right now. This is the moment to do it. 
This is totally the moment to do it. And for those governments in particular that are having now cost savings because of the uh, low oil uh, price, this is the perfect opportunity to take those cost savings and invest them into the infrastructure of the future because that's the one that is going to give them very predictable pricing in the future. We know that exposure to, to oil and gas is always going to be a volatile price. Renewable energy has one price, zero. You, do you have a short comment on yes, that? Yes, uh, on top of that, I see another opportunity. Um, I wonder if it's really a shocking issue to renewable because 20 years ago, more than 25% of the electricity came from oil. These days, less than 5%. So more of the electricity related with fossil fuels is coming, is coming from coal and natural gas. And honestly, in the markets that are working properly, Natural gas is completely decoupled from price of oil. And this is the case of North America, where it's a relevant change in, in shale gas and shale oil. So price of oil went down 50% or even more. Natural gas didn't. Even increase in, teeny, with a teeny, in a teeny margin, because there are completely different markets. Here in Europe, we happen the same. Now could be, in the short term, some common movements. But it's not a problem with the market. It's a problem of the regulation. Why? Because the price of natural gas is Touch, attached with the price of oil, which is a big mistake of the regulators. Honestly, it's going to be the couple, and the impact in renewable will be lesser than, than you are expecting, honestly, on top of the opportunity that you are talking about. All right, let's take one more question in the front row. Thank you very much. So I have a question for Foreign Minister Fabius. Um, Paris, the Paris Agreement, it's going to have, be a room with, or a house with many rooms, flexible, bottom up. How do we know that the agreement actually does something beyond what countries are going to do anyway? How are we going to know that? How are we going to convince the public that this huge effort is actually delivering value added? Well, I think, uh, first, uh, if and when uh, we can have uh, legally binding agreement, it is in line with the maximum uh, two degrees. And therefore, if you compare that with the business as usual uh, rhythm, it will be an advantage first. Second, and it's a tricky subject, but an important one, when Paris takes place, we shall have a rough idea about the addition of uh, the national contributions. Uh, we shall know where we are. And uh, my understanding is that if we are up compared to the two degrees, there will take place a necessary reaction, necessary mechanism in order, maybe not right now, but step by step, to get back to the two degrees. Third, uh, I rely, we rely on uh, the actions taken by companies, taken by region, taken by local authorities, and uh, new technologies being brought uh, for this opportunity. Therefore, all in all, in all, uh, all that will uh, bring something. Uh, there is one other point uh, I would like to mention, which is rather psychological and political. Uh, we have to show that the climate change, I prefer to call that climate disruption, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, change, sometimes it's viewed positively. If you say to uh, somebody uh, in the northern part of France that there will be a climate change, he thinks that he will live in Côte d'Azur. And, and therefore, but it's the reality, it's climate disruption. Uh, but the climate disruption, it's not for uh, 2100, it's for right now. We have to explain to people, and they're aware of that, that it's right now. What you said about uh, Beijing, it's, it's, it's reality. <laughs> I have inaugurated a few months ago a uh, lycée, a school in Beijing. And I will always have that in my eyes. We were uh, here uh, with the officials delivering beautiful speeches. And uh, the children who were in front of us, all of them wore a mask. 
And you know, this sort of climax, it was so, and therefore it's for now, we have the solutions, technical, hopefully financial, and it will help growth. If we are able to convince people. Michel Yez, I want to ask you, do you think that we're building up expectations too much perhaps before the Paris meeting? It's not an easy question. No, I, uh, I don't. Yes, first, yes, first yes, you, have, you, you, have to, you, you have to start with expectation if you want to achieve something. If you don't want to achieve anything, definitely you can start with a kind of pessimism. What I'm a little bit afraid is that there is apparently a kind of intellectual agreement. There is probably also an emotional agreement around the table. And probably uh, what, is, what is concern to me is that I have experienced that very often in Davos, that you have this kind of agreement, but when it comes to it, the reality, it is more complicated, it's more political, you need to find some compromise. You know, politics is the science of the possible, and that's uh, the reason why it's also admirable, because uh, it, it's not that obvious to bring 196 countries to agree. So I, um, I'm positive, definitely, but I believe that a little bit of peer pressure, as I said before, would add to the positive emotion that we are showing here. I don't think that everything will happen the way we want to see it happen if there is not a, a little bit of pressure. And uh, it must go be beyond awareness. It must probably go towards a kind of very official pricing of the decision that we are taking and the decision that we are not taking by people who are credible. And that will allow people to judge the consequence of, of a Paris meeting. And it's possible. But uh, I, again, I like emotion, I like ambition. I must recognize that humanity seems to react a little bit more on peer pressure than on uh, emotion. President Calderon, we don't have a lot of time left, but so I just want to get your, your, closing, your closing thoughts. Well, the, an agreement is a must for a human being. An agreement is possible along the, uh, the French diplomacy, which is among the best diplomacy in the world, could put itself <laughs> in everybody else's shoes, and that is the idea. Try to understand the less developed countries, try to understand the oil producer countries, trying to understand the middle class countries, trying to understand China, India, the United States, Canada, the Europe. And if we are able to match economic, the promised land of economic growth, with the help of climate change, doing the right thing, there is a solution. It is difficult, but I hope that the human being could be, could be fix its own future. Christiana Figueres? I'm equally as, as hopeful. I, I also do not uh, under, under uh, estimate the challenges that we have ahead of us. Uh, COP president here sitting here, we even, e even the French diplomacy, I think, is going to be challenged. Uh, but we are delighted to be in the hands and, and uh, supporting the French diplomacy. Uh, but it really, we have to understand what we're trying to do here, right? We are trying to change the paradigm and the path that we've had for 150 years. It is not a small task. It is not a small task. Uh, and therefore, there's not going to be a silver bullet the day after we finish Paris. It's not going to be everybody standing up and clapping and saying, we've solved climate change. No, that's not the way it's going to be. But we do have to revert that. What we have to do is ensure that what is in place is going to give us reverting the tendency that we have right now, the trajectory of increasing emissions. We have to get to the point where we decrease it. That is fundamentally what we have to do. We will use carbon pricing as a very powerful tool. We will use peer pressure as a very powerful tool. We will use businesses because they have to help. We will, frankly, this is so complicated and it's so huge that we need every single piece of help that we can. But as President Calderon said, we cannot afford to not get this agreement. So I am cautiously confident, uh, but very, very encouraged by the number of people, companies, governments, financial sector, everybody who are constantly coming up and saying, we're in, what can we do to help? It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. By far, by far the great majority want a solution because they know that A, we can't afford one, but also because they know it's the pathway toward future economic growth. So the story is only positive. What's there not to like? All right. We're going to...
wait and see, I suppose, in 10 months in, in, in Paris. Uh, ladies, lady and gentlemen, thank you very much once again for taking part in uh, this debate. Thank you to all of you in the audience for turning up today. I suppose we haven't much debated much whether or not there is a need for a climate change deal. I think there is agreement on this stage that there is a need for a climate change deal. But to a certain extent, I suppose that is a good sign that there seems to be a, a pretty unified mass when it comes to both business and politics to, to, to reach a, a climate change deal in Paris in uh, December. We need awareness, we need peer pressure, we need transparency for, for business so that business leaders know what's next, so to speak. We'll see if Paris manages to deliver that. Uh, I want to thank you for watching at home. Thank you for watching France 24 and stay with us. Thank you very much.